Well, thank you. It is wonderful to be able to speak virtually to people in Georgetown about a wonderful place and a great story. And I want to start by taking you on a physical journey about 30 miles from here as the crow flies, but it's a lot further by road. And in terms of culture, ecology, and history, it is a very distant place, one of the most beautiful, rich, and exciting places on the continent, I think. It's about a 10-minute boat ride from the public landing at Brook Green Gardens, just south of Brook Green, right off of Highway 17. As most people probably know by now, this place is called Sandy Island. I'll first introduce you to one of the main characters in the story who lives in this house, Laura Harriet. She, like virtually everyone on the island, is a descendant of Philip uh, Washington, who was one of the founders, or probably the founder, of this community. Laura is in the middle, and this is a picture of the Conservation League staff on a visit to Sandy Island. She's a wonderful hostess and a wonderful cook, and you can actually also even stay in, in her house, and it's just one of the great experiences, I think, in South Carolina. I want to start by reading a couple of paragraphs from Virginia Beach, my wife's book uh, about the Conservation League, and this chapter is on Sandy Island. But first, I want to remind us all that this uh, presentation is really inspired by the production of another beautiful book on Sandy Island, edited by Linda Ketron, and the photography by Ann Malarich. It is, it's just an extraordinary book, including this one chapter from the Conservation League books, but also some beautiful prose and beautiful paintings and beautiful photography uh, that uh, is, is new, uh, brand new, and you will not be able to find it anywhere but in this book called Sandy Island Forever. So Virginia wrote this in the, our chapter on Sandy Island. At age 63, Laura Harriet stands tall and walks with long, tall strides. Her laughter is quick and she reveals a luminous smile stretching across her broad face. She turns pensive when she reflects on her childhood. She says, I was born in a community called Georgie Hill on Sandy Island. It was named after my grandmother, who was the oldest lady on the island at the time. I lived with my grandmother until she passed and then went back to my mom. My father drowned when my mother was pregnant with me, so I never saw my dad. Laura attended the island's one-room schoolhouse built in the 1930s by Archer Huntington, who was a philanthropist and owned Brook Green Gardens. She says, for the first, second, and third grades, you went to the back, and the fourth, fifth, and sixth grades, you were in the front. And from there, Laura graduated from Howard High School in Georgetown and then went on to Columbia Commercial School to study business. Then she returned to Sandy Island and never left. And I think you'll agree there's good reason for that when you see uh, and hear about this extraordinary spot. Laura's grandfather purchased Wilma Cottage, this cottage, from Prince Washington. And Prince Washington was a grandson of Philip Washington. Philip had worked on pipe down plantation before uh, the Civil War, just upriver from Mount Arena. And after emancipation, he left Sandy Island and achieved a position of wealth and status that was rare among black men of his era. In 1878, Philip returned to Sandy Island, and in 1882, he bought the old Mount Arena Plantation, founded the new Bethel Baptist Church, which congregation is still there, and established a small self-governing community on the island. He died in 1890 and his property has been passed down through several generations. To this day, virtually all of the residents on Sandy Island are relatives of Philip Washington, either by blood or marriage. This is a, a photograph of one little picture of Virginia, but the big picture here is the magnificent longleaf pine forests that exist on this island, and almost uniquely on this island in the world. 
I was vaguely familiar with Sandy Island having grown up in Columbia and spent summers on the coast at Pawley's Island. And I was young, young then and water skied on the Waccamaw on the PD River. But I really didn't know any more than there was this big place in the middle of the Waccamaw on the PD called Sandy Island. I had no idea how large it was or that it had this extraordinary ecology of old growth longleaf pines or that it had a community of people who descended from slaves in the area, the Gullah people from ultimately descended from the rice growing areas of, um, of, of, of West Africa and the enslaved Africans who, were, who came here against their will to work on these plantations. The forest is really like no other. Let me go back, I'll just show you the forest again. Undulating as far as the eye can see across a long succession of sand hills, some of which are 80 feet high, which for people who understand the coast know that's like a mountain. It's like Mount Mitchell on the coast. Today, uh, the ancient sand dunes spawn this extraordinary and really unique plant community of longleaf pine, turkey oak, and the undergrowth understory that is again unique to the native pine savanna ecosystem in the southeast. Once covered, Longleaf covered 90 million acres from Virginia down to Florida and over to, over to Texas. This was the original extent of Longleaf Pine. It was, a, it was a beautiful ecosystem that really defined the, the south, the southeast. And um, John Bartram wrote about it, William Bartram riding galloping a horse from the sand hills down to the coast through these ancient forest. But today, the forest has been reduced uh, in size to literally a few patches of three or four million acres. And one of those patches, fortunately, is on Sandy Island. It's also, I think, worth noting that the Francis Marion National Forest to the south also harbors an extensive uh, old growth forest of longleaf pines, but there's not much of that left. It grows more slowly on Sandy Island just because of the sandy soils and the nutrient poor soils. Uh, and it is different looking on Sandy Island than anywhere that anywhere else because uh, these trees are much slower growing and they're some of the oldest, some of them virgin, uh, you know, never cut two to three hundred year old trees. When they reach maturity, their tops flatten out, so they look like something out of Dr. Seuss. Atypical of most pine trees, which of course have a uh, pinnacle shape. Even the live oaks grow differently here, and they're more gnarled and sculpted, a smaller variety, also known as uh, Sandhill live oak, which actually is even a different species. There are a lot of animals here that don't exist uh, anywhere else uh, in the world except in these ecosystems, these few, few remnant places, one of which, and the most probably well known, is the red cockaded woodpecker. 45 fam families of these birds, when I was over there, maybe there are more now, uh, were living on Sandy Island. This is an interesting bird because a dozen relatives work collectively to uh, form these nest colonies. And uh, they take six to 15 months excavating the cavities from the living longleaf. A lot of woodpeckers actually nest in dead trees, but w these woodpeckers do not. So it's a lot harder to dig a nest in a living tree than a dead tree. Uh, but uh, the trees, all, the birds also gravitate to these older longleaf that often have what are called cat faces on the pines that were tapped during the turpentine era in the late 19th and early 20th century. Turpentine was a big industry during that time for the naval stores uh, arena. And the rosin from the longleaf was more prolific and flowed faster than any of the other, other pine trees, including loblolly. So they were a favorite of the turpentine tappers. These birds also depend on the rosin because they dig holes in the bark and the rosin oozes down the tree and provides some level of protection against snakes and other intruders. 
Now, this is a photograph of the school that the Huntingtons built on the island in the early 19, 1900s. This image right here, you can see in the middle where it says Sandy Island. Sandy Island is just in terms of size, 12,000 acres. And so that makes it larger than the city of Myrtle Beach, 25 miles to the north. But it's certainly not as well known as Myrtle Beach, and in my view, thankfully for that. There are, here's another zoomed in image of it. You can see Sandy Island. It's right across the Waccamaw from Brook Green Gardens and Huntington Beach State Park. On the other side, the PD and the Waccamaw form come together to form Winya Bay, but the PD is also one of the great, what's called brown water rivers of the South Carolina low country. So Sandy Island is bordered on both sides by two of South Carolina's greatest rivers. Now, uh, there are no boats, uh, no roads on Sandy Island uh, that are paved. Uh, and uh, there are also no bridges. And so the residents have, over the years, uh, parked their boats on the uh, Waccamaw Neck side and, and taken them over as means of transportation. You know, most people use them for recreation, but they've, uh, they go back and forth. Uh, the pit roads are, are unpaved, and so there are cars over there, but no police. Um, Nobody speeding on Sandy Island. And uh, the night is quiet and dark, unlike anywhere I think I've been on the coast. And you can hear great horned owls, Chuck Wills Widows. And one morning when we were staying at Laura, Laura's house, we heard a uh, wood thrush singing in the morning. So it's a wonderful place to be, very peaceful and beautiful. Uh, the residents on the island live double lives in a way, with one foot on this, in this beautiful, tranquil place, and in, uh, the other foot when they go back and forth to work on the mainland, on the Waccamaw Neck, in these boats across the tannin-stained waters of the Waccamaw. There's a school boat that right here that takes the, has taken the children back and forth to school. But I will say, not to cherry, uh, not to sort of paint this in too rosy color, because transportation is a challenge. And I will say the Department of Transportation has been very little help helping get people back and forth. There are a lot of simple things that could be done that the islanders have, have advocated for, and, but it's been very difficult. Now, the islanders were, were quite uh, prominent, and many of them were very well educated and successful. And this is a picture I found in the, the 20s and 30s. Uh, and again, descendants of uh, Philip Washington. Our contact on the island and one of the and the leaders, one of the oldest men who I think uh, very he's still very healthy and vigorous, or at least I hope he is. I haven't talked to him in a year or so, but is Reverend Weathers, and most of his life was spent working in construction on the East Coast. Like most people, he had to work off of the island to make a living, return home to Sandy Island to live as, as a minister, and is a minister for. On the, uh, on the island today, and I guess you could say sort of the unofficial mayor of the island. Reverend Weathers was talking to us about this, and he said the minister, being a minister, is something you don't know whether you're going to do it or not. And he said, and a spirit of God will often lead you there. You ask him, uh, where do you get your calling? And the answer is through the spirit. God invites you to do his work, and he calls you. He says, I was called, as I was saying, when I was in construction. I was working in Columbia on the Columbia Mall when that, that area, place was being built. He said, I was about 18 or 20 feet up on a scaffold and using one of the machines to blow the, the plaster on the walls. It got clogged up, and I went up on the scaffold to loosen the joint and used a pipe wrench to break it loose. And when I finally broke it loose, the hose broke loose, and all the pressure knocked me off the scaffold. He said, I fell about 18 feet and landed 18 inches from the concrete that was down on the ground. He said, I was a lucky man. And he took me, they took me to the hospital, though, and one eye had been, it was full of cement. The doctor told my wife he wouldn't give me 50 cents for my eye or my vision. 
Now he said, though, I have one eye that I can see through and the other one a corneal transplant that got most of the damage. Uh, but he said, when I went to the hospital, I also went to the Lord and I told him I would accept his calling because he, that was what the Lord was doing. He was calling me to service. So uh, he is one of the wonderful residents of the island and also someone with whom we work very closely on the, on the debate over the future of Sandy Island. In the spring of 1993, I got a call from a friend of mine, Joe Carter, who was a developer from North Myrtle Beach and also a, a duck hunter and an outdoorsman. Uh, and he told me that uh, the majority owners of Sandy Island were, he was telling me this, uh, were planning to build a bridge to the island. He was worried about it turning into a resort, you know, which, of course, is the trajectory of so much of the coast of South Carolina. The owners were textile magnate Roger Milliken and Craig Wall, who was the heir of a very large wood products company and land development company in Myrtle Beach. We um, did not ha have any, now, any information on this permit, but we went and got the application. What we found out was that uh, Wall and Milliken, who had bought about 9,100 acres on the island, the northern end uh, had put fences and no trespassing signs up. And um, this was a sh shock, really, to the islanders because they had, had been able to use the land over the years for various things, firewood and hunting. And um, Mr. Milliken and Mr. Wall had applied for a permit to build a bridge. They, they said to transport timber to the mainland. And they'd been trying uh, to bridge Bull Creek for a good while, and this was sort of the culmination of all of that, this permit was. In fact, Sandy Island was actually part of 16,000 acres of land that were owned by the, by the two, the Sandy Island partners, contiguous undeveloped land, including uh, the, the island to the north, or the land to the north called Tip Top. They hoped to uh, link Route 701 across Tip Top and then across Bull Creek to Sandy Island. And then eventually a road would follow the course of the island down to the bottom, to the southern tip. Therefore, by opening up one of the largest tracts of developable waterfront land in South Carolina with literally 20 miles of waterfront. I mean, this thing would have been almost the size of Hilton Head. This is a map of the route of the bridge. You can see coming in near Bucksport, across Tip Top, then across the creek, and then down toward the bottom end of the island. And interestingly, the community of Sandy Island occupies the very southern end of the island. And the area above it is all a single owner, was a single ownership and still is. Uh, Craig Wall was heir to Canal Industries. His father had founded it in 1930. And Monty Paulson, who was reporting on all of this for the state newspaper, uh, printed a profile of Craig Wall for the state in 1995 and described it this way. He said, Craig Wall Jr. followed his father's formula of buying land in the path of progress sometimes even fa facilitating that progress. At first, many islanders supported the bridge because Sandy Island uh, associates had suggested that the residents would have access to it, and they needed that. Most residents worked on the mainland, and uh, they, they needed access in that direction, perhaps up toward Myrtle Beach, but also they needed it for emergencies. But, uh, what they found out fairly quickly was that the island, uh, that the bridge would only be available for emergencies at best um, due to the desire to limit liability. Other uh, uses of the road didn't, wouldn't be allowed. And Reverend Weathers said, we basically found out we would not be able to use the bridge on our own terms. Still, there was a question as understandably as to what how to perceive this 
bridge proposal as a threat, as an opportunity, as both, and what it, did it all mean? I called um, my friend Emory Campbell to see who is the direct, was the director of the Penn Center on St. Helena Island to the south near Beaufort. And I said, Emory, we would love to have an introduction to the citizens on Sandy Island. We don't know them, and we really feel like we need an emissary who can talk to them about the impact of development on the Sea Islands. And, and I think you're the best person I know to be able to do that. And um, so he agreed to make an overture to Reverend Weathers and others. And he and Joe McDummock, who is on the far right, Emory's in the middle, um, and that's York Glover, who's head of the, the Extension Service in Beaufort, and then me, how I ended up getting no height, I don't know, but, and Nina Morais, my friend uh, who ran the Penn School for Preservation next to me. Anyway, they called and were able to uh, agree to meet with the Islanders and talk to them about the bridge and some of the concerns and interests they had in it. When they arrived, Emory said, the first thing they, 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 they heard was, if you don't have any jobs, uh, then we're really not interested because uh, these people are going to bring us jobs, they said, about Sandy Island Associates. But we soon discovered that the islanders really didn't know too much more about the bridge permit than we did, and we didn't know anything about it. And particularly, they didn't know uh, to what extent, again, they'd be able to use the bridge, what the purpose of the bridge was, and any of those things that were really relevant to the question of what their future would, would be with it or without it. We, um, we objected to the permit through the Coastal Council, then called, now called Office of Coastal Resource Management. But we also tried to contact uh, the owners of the island, Mr. Milliken and Mr. Wall, to see if there was any possibility, if we could raise the money of buying any part of this, this 9,100 acres, or even all of it. Spence Wise, who was working for Mr. Milliken and was his spokesman at the time, was our contact. And when I asked him about it, he said, Mr. Milliken never sells land, ever. So that was at least the end of that conversation. So we proceeded along the permitting route and communicated with the Sandy Islanders about our interest in challenging the permit, at least to find out more information about what it, the purpose of the bridge would be. And um, pretty soon, uh, the Islanders decided that this was probably not something they wanted to endorse, at least certainly not right away. Uh, so they agreed with us to oppose the bridge, seeing little benefit and concerned, as, as we all were, about development of the island having adverse impacts on their, their community, their lifestyle, their tax bills, and all of the other things that, that are question marks with development. Joe, invited, Joe McDummock uh, invited the Sandy Islanders to come down to St. Helena and see some of the uh, development that had followed bridged construction on Hilton Head and in that area in Beaufort County. And so about a dozen uh, Sandy Islanders, including Reverend Weathers, boarded a van, drove down, and met with Emory and Joe at the uh, Penn Center at Darrell Hall, which is the main uh, sort of meeting place at Penn. And as and Emory walked in and he greeted the Sandy Islanders, whom he had not really he had not met met them before. He'd talk, spoke spoken to them briefly at the bridge, but he said, uh, and I'm going to probably butcher this gala question, but he said, "How are we to do today?" And and one and the Sandy Islanders said, "Fine, thank you." And and Emory said, "So you speak that language too?" And the ice was broken, and they had a, a, a vigorous conversation about growing up, uh, as Emory did, on Hilton Head before the bridge, and then what uh, happened after the bridge to Hilton Head was constructed. 
He said, we had a great life. In the mid-50s, the highway department began proposing the bridge and putting a new road in, and we thought it would be great, he said. And we were dead wrong. Emory took the Sandy Islanders all around Hilton Head that day, where 70% of the land is now inside gated communities. He stopped for lunch across the river on, uh, from Defusky, and they talked about the future and their aspirations for the Sandy Island. The first hearing on the bridge permit application was scheduled by the Office of Coastal Resource Management in Beaufort, far away from Sandy Island. It's a two hour, at least, maybe a three hour drive. And Reverend Weather said, I didn't, we didn't know anything about it until Dana gave me a call and said, do you know we're having a, they're having a meeting in reference to the permit for the bridge? And Reverend Weather said, no, no one has uh, called us about that. So I, I, we discussed it and uh, encouraged, he encouraged some other members of the community to go down with him to meet and uh, participate in that hearing. And that's what they did. The Coastal uh, Conservation League, which I was director of at the time, had engaged David Farron with the Southern Environmental Law Center to represent us in our opposition to the bridge permit. And David said, I remember driving down from Chapel Hill to Beaufort and meeting Dana and Emery, as well as the delegation from Sandy Island that day. Uh, the Office of Coastal Resource Management gave me 10 minutes to say what, why they shouldn't grant the permit. And frankly, I thought we'd lost. But it turned out we actually won because OCRM, in issuing the certification, unwittingly attached two conditions that would ultimately prove insurmountable to Sandy Island Associates. They had to come up with an endangered species mitigation plan for the red cockaded woodpeckers. Uh, and that was uh, something they, they never successfully did. David Farron submitted a comment letter on our behalf showing that Sandy Island and other islands like it were normally timbered using barges. So the br bridge really wasn't necessary for, for forestry. Meanwhile, he and the Conservation League engaged a professional forester to estimate how much the timber would be worth and how much the bridge cost. And what we discovered was that the bridge cost more than the timber would bring them in value. So the bridge clearly was not uh, a good investment on the part of Sandy Island Associates simply to timber the island. The Coast Guard had to approve the permit on top of OCRM. This was somewhat new to us. We'd mostly been dealing with Office of Coastal Resource Management. And so they held a public hearing, and frankly, they were much harder to deal with than the Office of Coastal Resource Management. They held a schedule of hearing in Charleston. You know, nobody's scheduling them up near Sandy Island at Murray Vocational School, which is now a development, near the Coast Guard Station, and a meeting for which no public notice was given. It was an interagency meeting with Fish and Wildlife and others. We found out about it. And uh, we called uh, Reverend Weathers and others and, and encouraged them to come. In addition to that, we let Monty Paulson know, who was again writing on this, on this issue uh, from the state newspaper. Uh, and Monty came down with a photographer named Jamie Francis, who actually had already photographed Sandy Island for another reason. Um, we walked in the door. And the Coast Guard colonel was surprised to see us because he, he, and he said to us, this is a private meeting. You're not allowed to be here. And Monty said, well, would you hang on a minute while I get my photographer to throw, photograph you throwing us out of the meeting? And so the colonel said, well, you can stay, but you have to sit over here and not at the table where all the officials are. So we and the Sandy Islands all sat in these little chairs on the wall and listen to them talk about the future of Sandy Island. David uh, was looking for the sort of smoking gun of what actually was going to be done with Sandy Island if the bridge was built. And he describes uh, working on this, looking, looking, not finding anything for almost a year. And he said, 
He said, I was in Myrtle Beach for something else, though, one day, and I decided to stop by the branch office of the State Department of Health and Environmental Control, which is the parent agency of OCRM, to look in their records. And the receptionist was there. Everybody else was out to lunch. And she, I asked her if there was a file for Sandy Island. And she found it and gave it to me. And I looked through it. And I discovered in it the development plan for Sandy Island. No one had seen that before. It dated 1990. And I told the receptionist I found something I wanted to copy. And could I please just use their copy machine, which she allowed me to do. The first thing I did, David said, was to call Monty at the state and ask him how much he would pay for a Mickey Mantle baseball card. And finding the development plan I thought was even bigger than that. It blew the, the story wide open. Monty wrote an article reporting that Sandy Island Associates said they had no plans to develop the island, but in fact here was a plan to put 20,000 houses, uh, 20,000 people and 10,000 houses in an exclusive and elite, as they described it, resort community of condos with at least two golf courses. Until that point, the Conservation League and the coalition had really had little success communicating with Sandy Island Associates, the owners and their representatives. Sidney Futch was working in, in Myrtle Beach uh, for Canal Industries, and he represented Craig Wall and and Spence Wise, again, representing Mr. Milliken with Sandy Island Associates. Both had rebuffed our attempts to get together to discuss it. But one day after the big news break came out, I got a call from Pat Morgan, who was director of the Nature Conservancy in South Carolina at the time. And he said that one of his board members had been in New York and was a friend of one of the Nature Conservancy's Long Island chapter board members named Rick Webble. And Sandy Island came up in the conversation and Rick said, well, by the way, I happen to be uh, Mr. Milliken's landscape architect. I work with him on new plants and also I've done some things in Spartanburg. And uh, Rab Finley, who had made the connection, said, uh, well, you and uh, Pat and Dana might want to sit down and talk about Sandy Island. So we arranged a date to do that. And it was agreed that we would pick Rick up at the Charleston airport. So Pat and I drove over there and met Rick. We'd never met him before. It seemed very clandestine to me. We found him. He got in the car. And we drove over to Roger Milliken's house at Yeamans Hall, sat in the living room. There's nobody else in the house. And we talked about how we could fi figure out a way to make this property develop in a meaningful enough way they could get some money out of it, but not really harm the community. I said, well, I, if we could protect the whole piece, that would be the best thing we could imagine. But uh, Rick said he would try to figure out how far we could go with it. And he would take the message back to Mr. Milliken. We met a number of times after that, and, and Pat talked to Rick on and off on the phone. Um, and it seemed like we were making progress until we found out one day that the Milliken textile plant in LaGrange, Georgia, had, had burned to the ground the night before. And uh, Mr. Milliken called off all meetings and all discussion of anything and, and moved, literally moved to the plant site while they rebuilt it. He lived, as I was told, in a, in a mobile home on the plant site and watched them rebuild it. The meanwhile, meanwhile, and that took about a year, meanwhile, Sandy Island Associates continued to refuse to provide a comprehensive endangered species mitigation plan for the red cockaded woodpecker. They're moving along in the permitting. They attempted to have Roger Banks at U.S. Fish and Wildlife, who was pushing for it, removed from the, from the case. And eventually, the Office of Coastal Resource Management, Fish and Wildlife, and the Department of Natural Resources rejected the permit application, which was quite unusual. In addition, David Farron had developed a relationship with the New York Times reporter named Ron Smothers. 
And Ron wrote a series of three articles on the battle for Sandy Island. The first one appeared in May of 1995, the second one in December, and then the final one in the spring of 96. National report, proposal for a bridge intrudes on island life. And it was a beautiful article, and, and Ron Smothers went to the island and interviewed some of the residents. And, and it really uh, brought national attention, and it should have had, to this, to this debate going on about the future of this island. Similarly, Marty Paulson at the state was also churning out articles, and Zane Wilson with the Sun News, Lynn Langley with the Post and Courier were writing about it, and Sandy Allen became essentially a cause celeb both in the state and even nationally. And David thinks, and certainly this seems reasonable, that the publicity of, on it motivated uh, Roger Milliken and Craig Wall to work more closely with us. And I will say that this is not what always happens with developers. A lot of times they just uh, sort of hunker down and and become even more resistant to anything once they start getting uh, publicity like this, but not these two. So I give them a lot of credit for that. Finally, in the winter of 95, we got a call uh, from Rick. And Rick said, Mr. Milliken has decided to, that he would like to consider selling the island. Can you get an appraiser? So we recommended Mike Robinson in Charleston, who was a very renowned uh, and experienced in large land holdings. And um, he appraised the island, and the, the, the appraisal value came back to this day. I can't believe it, but it came back at $12 million. It's just as chicken feed these days. You can't even buy a big house on Hilton Head for that. But uh, we were delighted and felt that we could possibly raise that money uh, but we didn't have any idea where we were going to get it. And so uh, Pat and I uh, decided that one way to do it uh, would be to look around at, at un, what we call unconventional sources of money. About the same time we were working on that, Rick, uh, with Rick, the Department of Transportation was planning to build the Conway Bypass. And the bypass entailed filling or bridging about 200 acres of, of, of wetlands that were basically, had been converted to pine plantations, but they were still classified as wetlands. And the bridging would have cost the DOT hundreds of millions of dollars. So they wanted to find a way that they could instead build a causeway and not, not bridge. Um, Mitigation, which is, you know, not without controversy, was one way they felt they might be able to do that. So, uh, we agreed to see if that uh, DOT might be able to mitigate for these, the impacts by helping us with this purchase. And um, I called Buck Limehouse, who is here, former head of the, the DOT commission, Secretary of Transportation, and asked him if we could come over and talk about mitigation. Pat and I showed up at his office, and I said, we've got a great mitigation site for the Conway Bypass, Sandy Island. And Buck said, no, we've already talked to them, and they're not going to sell. And I, I said, well, we just heard more recent information. We think that uh, for $12 million, uh, you can buy it. And so, uh, and I said, I don't know why I said this. It just seemed like a good idea at the time. I said, and the Nature Conservancy will put another million into it, so you only have to pay 11. And further, we heard that Mr. Milliken was willing to take a $1 million discount. So that started the process. And, and Buck, being a real estate guy himself, knew a good deal when he saw it. And he began to move the process forward. In, and it had to go through the agencies for approval. It was sort of an unconventional way to mitigate uh, for wetland impacts, but it was one that we all instinctively knew was a, a tremendous victory for the state and for the region, but uh, we had to make sure it fit into the regulatory structure. So 
the arrangement was set up that DOT would take title to the island and then when the mitigation credits were all used up because there would be more associated with that purchase than they, they even needed for the Conway Bypass, uh, they would then transfer ownership to the Nature Conservancy. On March 13th of 1996, the agreement was signed between the state and Sandy Island Associates confirming their purchase by the, DO, by the DOT of $11 million purchase of Sandy Island. In addition, the DOT agreed to buy 7,700 more acres of Cypress Tupelo Swamp along the Waccamaw, also valued at about $1.9 million. That was also a tremendous save. And so 16,800 acres would serve as the corpus for this mitigation bank to offset the Conway Bypass and additional road construction needs in that area. At the time, Sandy Island was, it was written up all over the country and considered one of the most successful and, and innovative wetland mitigation initiatives ever undertaken uh, in, in, in the country. The three-year battle was over, and a few people believe that that it could have ever happened that way. It was a model of collaborative conservation, I think rarely seen in the conservation movement uh, at the time, and even frankly, sadly, still not so common. Uh, but it also was a result of a number of unexpected and, and fortuitous events that happened uh, and, and, and people who were willing to work together. That was a, another very important aspect of all of this. David Farron, who's now the director of the Donnelly Foundation in Chicago, said, Sandy Island was, quote, one of the top legal cases of my career and my life, he said. He said, the experience of it, having that outcome, helped me give myself permission to take a sabbatical and spend time with my children. Um, and David later bought a house at Georgetown, which he still owns. On March the 8th of the same year, the remaining Sandy Island lands were transferred to the Nature Conservancy and formally dedicated as the Sandy Island Preserve. Fast forward today, part of the, the Waccamaw National Wildlife Refuge, and it continues to build, again, most recently with the addition of Hasty Point. That same day, literally the day, March 8th, Craig Wall was laid to rest having died of a heart attack the week before. An unbelievable, remarkable, strange coincidence. From a land use perspective, David said the bigger context was just as important as the, as the pres preservation of Sandy Island, and he's certainly right. It was the keystone to what would happen elsewhere along the PD and on the Waccamaw. The concern was that if Sandy Island were to develop, there would be less inclination on the part of landowners on the PD especially to protect their property in perpetuity as a part of the Winya Bay Initiative. Once it was protected, a number of easements were granted, private easements on, on properties along the PD up and down, and today the Winya Bay Initiative was one of the most successful con conservation efforts in the country and protect some of the most important land in the country. The, the point, I think, too, is that maybe the most important point is that this community really was such a rock of confidence and stability on Sandy Island, and they were worked with us throughout the entire effort and exemplified, in a way, the things that could be lost that people so often have trouble understanding when you talk about development harming communities. I mean, it was so clear what was at risk here, and this was such a wonderful group of people, um, and, and so compelling that um, I think had it not been for the Sandy Island community, it would, the whole thing would, would not have ever happened. Um, here's the church on Sandy Island. This picture was taken by Jamie Francis as part of the series in the state newspaper in the mid-90s. 
And here is what Reverend Weathers said. He said, this is home. The rest of the world is the other side. I just feel fortunate to have been a part of it.